Father, thank you for this day. We pray that you would uh, guide us into all truth, uh, direct our steps today. pray that you would help us to remember uh, to focus upon the Lord Jesus Christ as our life, as the one who has uh, brought us salvation and mediated uh, in regard to the payment of sin. And we thank you, Father, for uh, the testimony of his life to live. Um, pray that you would help us to give ourselves to that which is the most important, uh, to prioritize our lives as you would have us to, and to learn more and more uh, how to honor you, how to uphold the name of Jesus Christ and all that we do and say and think. Uh, direct our class today, and uh, ask in his name, amen. So uh, just to remind us that... Um, That Daniel is part of the writings in the Hebrew Bible as they arranged the canon. We put it in the prophets because of material, and that's sort of interesting. Um, and in because of that, it's like Daniel is really being considered more as a statesman, more as uh, in in regard to his interaction with uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the kings of uh, of the captivity. And so he's classified with, with Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. And the, the Hebrews are fully aware of the content. But it is interesting that uh, whereas we consider him one of the greatest prophets, and certainly the prophet that uh, we are most interested in in regard to the end times, uh, yet the Hebrews put him in, um, in this different category with Chronicles. Really doesn't change how we approach the book, how we understand it. We're looking at it chronologically rather than uh, canonically, uh, anyway. Um, we had noted that the book is divided into two parts: uh, a part that has to do more with God overseeing and directing the nations in the outworking of history. We'll look at that in a little more detail in a moment this morning. Uh, God's interaction with Nebuchadnezzar. And then the second part, beginning in chapter 8, written in Hebrew rather than Aramaic, which the first part is, uh, shifts then to more how Israel is going to be protected and provided and cared for um, in this context of God working through the nations. And we see that uh, this is really where the times of the Gentiles begin. It's the time when God will be working with the nation primarily through other nations, uh, they will not be in the land, uh, secure, ruling themselves again until Messiah returns, really. So it's going to be se several, you know, a couple of thousand years. Um, and so the time of the Gentiles begins here, and that's, uh, that's one of the things uh, we need to see. Um, we had taken a look at the end of uh, last Friday on uh, Daniel's friends. Uh, noted that um, they bought both bought, got both Hebrew and um, uh, Babylonian names. What language would it have been? I don't know. Aramaic, probably. And uh, just looked at the meaning of them. And one question that's often asked, and I think that somebody asked it even after class uh, uh, on Friday, uh, why does the Bible refer to them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? and yet refers to Daniel consistently as Daniel, though we find both uh, sets of names in the book. And one of the things that occurs to me is that uh, um, the three friends really uh, illustrate, uh, as Daniel does, but they illustrate it in a different way, uh, the resistance to uh, integration, the resistance to assimilation into Babylonian religion, into Babylonian culture in that regard, in a negative sense. And so they stay faithful to God. And giving them Babylonian names would have been primarily for the purpose of assimilating them into the totality of Babylonian culture, including worship, including religion. And so while they are called by these names and uh, they uh, are uh, therefore associated with the gods of Babylon, they act uh, in in distinction to that, they act counter to that. And so we see part of the message of uh, <clears throat> Daniel in this, this whole thing is that no matter what they may call you, no matter how they may bend you or try to bend you and mold you into the culture, 
your job is to remain faithful to God, and they do. And so they are uh, willing to give themselves in death, and we find that God protects them. And so that's, uh, you know, the thing that occurs to me as to why the Bible would refer to them in their Babylonian names uh, so often. Uh, Daniel, um, you know, his, you know, his name shines through. His name remains uh, the Hebrew name for, for the most part. And I think it just kind of sets him off. He's got a different kind of a ministry. He's got a different way of representing God, though he likewise is spared in the lion's den. Yet he also has a, uh, a role that goes beyond the three friends. So just kind of thinking through the comparisons and the contrasts in, in the names uh, may result in, in something like uh, something like that. Now, I just want to go on to uh, uh, pick up, I think that's where we left off the other day, and to just think through a little more about uh, the four friends. And Bayless, in uh, Creation of the Cross, uh, summarizes them like this. They were pioneers in a foreign land. And the questions are for not just them, but for the whole of the nation, because they're representative of God's people. They're representative of the faithful in God's people. Um, How would they adapt? Uh, Could they still worship Yahweh in this foreign land? How much culture should they adopt, and would they lose their identity as a people? Uh, there's really a crisis of, uh, of identity that Israel uh, must have experienced during this time. And the, the three friends, uh, actually Daniel and the, his uh, three companions, uh, really are a, a, an object lesson of the positive answer to these questions. Um, they would adapt to the culture only so far as their faith allowed them. And so while uh, Jeremiah instructed them to go, to live there, to don't, don't you know, keep, unpack your bags, you're not coming back, you're going to be there 70 years, uh, build houses and, and be a blessing to those people, uh, yet they were still to, to be distinct. And so we find in them a, a positive response uh, in, this, uh, in this regard. Uh, just continuing with this, uh, um, with this idea of the pioneers in a foreign land. Uh, Daniel's visions and interpretations provided the roadmap uh, for the future. This is on page 61 of your notes. And so we see that uh, he lives and prospers under four kings and two foreign powers. And so Daniel is able to be the consistent one. Daniel is the one who... Uh, who survives all of these changes in government. And uh, there again, we see God's hand, and we see uh, a a measure of encouragement for the nation of Israel. The times of the Gentiles were divinely ordained and clearly survivable. So even though the the Jewish nation was going to come under some kind of an influence, were either complete, as in the Babylonian captivity, or partial as they come back into the land and they survive through all of the, uh, uh, the times of the Maccabean revolts and so forth into the New Testament, even into uh, today. Um, no matter how much Israel may be subjugated under the thumb of, uh, of hostile nations and powers, no matter how uh, much um, the hand of nations may be against them, uh, it, there's, it's survivable and God is involved in that. And so we see in a demonstration historically through the uh, experiences of these uh, pioneers um, that God is uh, in control of the future, he's in control of history, he's in control of the nations. And so the nations cannot thwart God's purpose with his people. And we see that their ministry and experience provided a model for the faithful to follow. So on a national level, on a corporate level, on a, on a prophetic level, in terms of what is God is doing with the earth, we see you know, Israel surviving. On an individual level, though not every Israelite stayed faithful. Not every Israelite returned to the land 70 years later. Uh, some did become assimilated into Babylonian culture and probably became, and, and as they were born and raised, uh, I'm sure there were many who did not believe in Yahweh. But... Um, but there are those who did. And so we see Ezra and Nehemiah leading faithful back to Jerusalem when the uh, time comes. 
And so we see that there is a, a, a ministry, an experience, an attitude, a mindset, an example of how to live faithfully in times that uh, want to, uh, to press you in uh, to the mold of the world. And so we can learn from that. I mean, as the church, we learn from the experience of Israel. We learn from individuals in the Old Testament. Um, you know, we're told, do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we live in a similar situation. We're in a hostile environment. Uh, we're in the world system. The world system wants to conform us to what it is. And we can learn from Daniel in terms of the, uh, uh, the experience of these who, who've uh, resisted that, uh, that conformity. So, um, so there is a lesson to be learned for Israel, for us, just from considering these four, uh, four individuals. They make great Sunday school stories, uh, but there's a lot more there than what tor- typically, typically, yeah, normally gets taught in Sunday school. My tongue's backwards this morning, too. So, um, four friends. Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar becomes a, an object lesson. Uh, he becomes an object lesson in terms of, uh, um, again, uh, God's dealing with a, with a Gentile king. Daniel 2, verses 20, um, Nebuchadnezzar's confession. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and the season. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. Wow, what a confession. This is coming from the, the mouth of a, of a pagan king. This is the dream. Now we will tell you the interpret of it for the king. Well, that's, that's Daniel's, Daniel's words. Uh, this, is the, this is the interpretation. We will tell the interpretation of it for the king. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. Now, this is the vision we have. We'll look at it in a moment in terms of, of what, it's, uh, what it's relating to. But very clearly, God is working through Nebuchadnezzar, and God is working in Nebuchadnezzar. And um, we see then the Nebuchadnezzar falling on his face, prostrate before Daniel, commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Then the king promoted Daniel, gave him many great gifts. He made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Also Daniel petitioned the king. He set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. So we see here that God uh, is working, again, through Nebuchadnezzar, but he also is working with Nebuchadnezzar. He reveals himself to Nebuchadnezzar. And you want to say, well, was Nebuchadnezzar a believer? We're going to see him in heaven. Don't be surprised if you do. (laughs) But the point is, he does submit to, to God, to God's revelation of himself. And whether it is simply in an intellectual uh, appreciation of the fact that uh, um, there had to be something more than just Daniel's uh, magicianship uh, to give him this uh, message, yet we do see him responding. And I think there are some lessons here to be learned uh, about Nebuchadnezzar. The first is God is still working. Just because Israel is in captivity, just because Israel has been disciplined and sent to Babylon, it doesn't mean God is finished with them. They are there in discipline. They are there because of their sin. They are there because of the sin of the nation. They are there because they've broken the covenant. They have violated the the arrangement by which God had uh, brought them to himself. Yet still he's working in their lives. And so this is one of the key lessons uh, from Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Secondly, God reveals his plan for the nations. And so um, we see here in this king and through this king uh, that God is actually saying what he's going to do not only with the king and his nation, but what he's going to do with the rest of the nations. And there's no book that more clearly shows, no book in the Bible that more clearly shows 
God's uh, involvement in national affairs, God's involvement in the uh, the international relations uh, of of various nations in a period of history. Um, Paul evidences that in Acts chapter 17 in that he says that God has made from one blood every every man on the face of the earth, every uh, uh, race or... Hmm, he doesn't use the word race. Uh, anyway, that he has created the nations, he has appointed the, their times and the boundaries of their habitations. And so God isn't just working with one nation. God is uh, controlling and organizing all the nations. And so we see him revealing his plan for the nations through uh, through this one uh, man. And the other thing is we see that Nebuchadnezzar is responsible for his choices and character. Um, and again, there is evidence throughout the scriptures that God deals directly with nations and he holds nations accountable for their behavior. You remember reading through the prophet uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah. In fact, Jeremiah is called a prophet to the nations. And while he didn't go and preach to nations like we find uh, Jonah doing to the Ninevites, yet um, the nations are being held accountable. And uh, when God judges Assyria, he judges Assyria on the basis of their cruelty. He had used them as an instrument. And yet he later judges them for their character as a nation. Now, each individual is, you know, responsible before God. And God reveals himself to every individual in the world through nature to begin with, through the conscience that they're given, Romans chapter 2. Everybody who's ever born into the world has an innate sense of God, of this deity that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 1. But he also deals with people groups. And those people groups are held accountable to a certain standard. Now, how do they know that? How do they know what is right and wrong? How can God fairly judge them if he hasn't given them Torah, if he hasn't given them instruction? Well, I think he has. He has in the very nature and heart of people. People organize themselves in certain ways. And all governments, all peoples have some system of the administration of justice. It may get whacked out of shape and perverted, but there still there's a sense this is right and this is wrong and this protects society and this is harmful to it. And so God is holding this man responsible and his, uh, is judging him and his kingdom. And so Nebuchadnezzar is responsible for his choices and for his character. And I think we see this very clearly uh, in Daniel's case. So Nebuchadnezzar in himself becomes a great object lesson of how God is, is working through these, uh, um, this pagan king and through, uh, through these nations. Okay, questions there before we go on? Kyle, did you have a question? Did I answer it? Okay. Anything else? If you ever get a chance to have a Bible study with a bunch of politicians, this is the book I would use. This is the book I'd use. Why? Because more than any other book, it shows that God holds governments accountable for how they govern. Whether or not they claim to even believe in God, he holds governments accountable. And I think it would be very, very interesting to study this book with a group who are, who are involved in any way in, in government, in governing, in, in politics, in the affairs of, of, of state. Uh, because it shows very clearly a, an example, and it's a notable example. It's an unusual case. God doesn't, you know, speak to every king like this. Uh, but very clearly we see a, a, the principles in terms of his oversight and how he holds governments responsible, which can be... Um, uh, you know, supported uh, throughout scriptures. You know, Proverbs says, uh, um, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You know, that's just a, just a general statement. And so there is a natural revelation, and uh, it's enough to make people and governments accountable. So Nebuchadnezzar in himself, God is sovereign over the nations. And um, he deals with them both in a corporate sense 
and individually in terms of kings, kings who are their nation in many cases. That's not the case everywhere. It's not the case in every form of government. Uh, but it's very clear that, uh, that God is in control of all of this uh, here. Okay, just uh, beginning to look at the uh, visions of the times of the Gentiles. And um, we have this, uh, this vision of Nebuchadnezzar where he sees this, uh, this image. And uh, in chapter 2, we see the image being characterized uh, in terms of the, uh, the materials that make it up. You've got uh, the head of gold, uh, the torso of silver, and then bronze, and then the uh, um, leg and feet extremities of iron and iron and clay. There's obviously a symbolism uh, going on in here. Uh, as we read in chapter 7, but God be, uh, also gives uh, uh, images of the nations, I believe, and according to animals. And so there's the winged lion. There's the uh, lopsided bear, a winged leopard. And then uh, a unique beast, uh, whatever translation you find there is, is grasping at how to get a hold of this horrible beast or mean beast, or it's a unique beast. It's just hard to describe. And so we see these, uh, these four animals, and these four animals do line up with the, uh, uh, with the four um, metals. And then in chapter 8, we find uh, two of these. Now, again, I'm not going to go into all of the, uh, um, the details of this, but this is just how it reads in a straightforward case. So that the silver nation, the lopsided bear, uh, is uh, likened to a ram in chapter 8. And then the third, the bronze, the winged leopard, is likened to a goat. And so just this image is being built, and it's being laid, you know, kind of layered. And, of course, we're dealing with just the consistent way in which uh, prophecy is often, often carried along in terms of, uh, of imagery. But God also gives the interpretation. And so he actually does name kingdoms. And uh, as we read in the book of Daniel... Uh, the gold, the winged lion, is the Neo-Babylonian Empire. And this is the empire that Daniel is uh, relating to in regard to Nebuchadnezzar. And he tells Nebuchadnezzar, you're this head of gold. And so it's very clear that Nebuchadnezzar and his nation are being represented by this, uh, uh, this image. The silver, the second nation, is the Medo-Persian kingdom. The Medes and the Persians, two separate kingdoms that merged, uh, that merged under Cyrus and Cyrus's control. The third nation involved, which is represented by bronze, the winged leopard, uh, the goat, is the nation of Greece. And then finally, the iron, the iron and clay, the unique beast, is going to be Rome. Now, again, those who are um, hesitant to accept genuine prophecy that any man could write about future kingdoms and future governments and world events, doesn't really want to accept this scheme. And the most common way to get around it is to say that it's talking about Neo-Babylon, Median, Persia, and Greece. And that way it all can be uh, you know, encapsulated uh, in the, the time of writing. But uh, that really isn't how it, it reads in a straightforward uh, fashion. Um, if you uh, stay here for a four-year degree, one of the requirement courses will be eschatology, and you will study this in detail. If you stay and take an elective, uh, Dan Revelation, then you'll also study this in detail. But this is basically the, the way this uh, book lays out in terms of Daniel's visions of the times of the Gentiles, and what it's clearly showing is, is that God is beforehand laying out the course of the world, really to the end of time, to the end of uh, Israel's time and what Daniel's going to talk about uh, in chapter 9 uh, in terms of the kingdoms. Because Rome has a, an immediate uh, expression after Greece, and then it uh, will have a, uh, an end-time expression 
And Revelation picks up that imagery and develops this. The thing you need to remember is when you read Revelation, the outline for Revelation in terms of the unfolding of events has already been laid down in Daniel. It will be uh, uh, developed uh, similarly in Zechariah. But it's Daniel that's already given the outline, It's already given the particulars, has already laid out the, the, the time sequence. And, and revelation then can be ter- interpreted uh, on that background. Jeff? What, what's the significance of each head and were they representative of that? Yeah, and, and in fact, the lion was a symbol of, of uh, Babylon. You find it on the, you know, the excavation of the walls and so forth. And the winged lion, again, just, just speed. Um, the winged leopard, uh, the, uh, um, the rapidity with which Alexander conquered the world is, you know, fits in with that. The lopsided bear looks at, at two uh, powers which are not equal in strength. And, and so they're, you know, it's that kind of a thing. Um, and then this unique beast is just, you know, um, well, it, it leaves it open. Uh, it's, it's kind of unlike any other known kingdom. And so Rome has uh, those kinds of characteristics in the various uh, ways that Rome is manifested both in the uh, first Roman Empire, but then in uh, how it's uh, uh, how the end time uh, governments and so forth are uh, talked about under the title of Rome in the uh, Book of Revelation. Now, just uh, a little bit more, just seeing how this develops in Daniel chapter seven. Um, you have in seven seventeen the mention of four beasts. Let me just read this. Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which rise out of the earth. And so 717, it's clearly interpreting this the thing. The four, the four beasts are four kings, and they are actually four kingdoms. And it goes on to show that. The saints of the Most High receive the kingdom, possess the kingdom forever. And so you've got four beasts, which are four kings, which are four kingdoms. And so the book really interprets itself. It's, it really is not a... Uh, a big mystery as to what's going on here. It's just uh, uh, really fan- fascinating that, that God is laying this all out beforehand. In chapter 7, verse 8 and 11, it talks about a little horn speaking uh, boastful words. And um, and this uh, is part of the book. And um, you see this theme worked out then through the... Uh, uh, succeeding prophecies, and you see this uh, coming out in Revelation as, as the man of sin or the Antichrist or, you know, the one who will uh, lift himself up against against God. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, uh, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, a mouth speaking pompous words. In verse 11, um, I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain, its body destroyed, giving to the burning flame. There's obviously a, a contest. There's obviously a conflict going on here. And so in all of this, there is, uh, you know, these nations. And then um, in chapter 7, verse 9, we've got the Ancient of Days seated in judgment. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. I mean, the concept of kingdom and God's kingdom and rule upon earth is from the right from the beginning of the Bible. And so we see a further development of that now within the context of Israel among the nations. And a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books, uh, the books were open. And we find the beast being killed in verse uh, 11. Uh, verse 12, the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And uh, then we find in verses 13 to 14, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. 
His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one uh, which shall not be destroyed. And here we see that title that we found in Ezekiel, son of man, which referred to his, uh, his uh, humility, his servant, and his servanthood. And here we see it referring to the eternal son. And, uh, and so we see here the giving of authority, an everlasting dominion, a kingdom. And uh, you just think back of all the messianic prophecies of the Davidic covenant, and we see again this is just fitting, uh, fitting in that flow. Mm-hmm.